afternoon. It's Sunday, April 12th. I'm Ariel O'Sullivan, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. After a brief timeout for the Passover holiday, coalition negotiations between Likud and potential government partners have resumed 10 days before the first deadline for forming a government. Here with more is IBA's political correspondent, Ellie Wogelenter. The Prime Minister is hoping to sign coalition agreements with all of his prospective partners, UTJ, Shas, Yisrael Beitenu, Bayit Yudi, and Kulanu, at the same time. But because of that desire, Netanyahu is reluctant to make commitments to the Haredi parties and Avigdor Lieberman's Yisrael Beitenu until the details are finalized among the remainder of his partners. The delay has led to criticism from those partners. Foreign Minister Lieberman charged this morning that Likud was delaying an agreement, possibly in order to prepare the ground for a national unity government with Zionist Union. Netanyahu has the right to close a deal with Isaac Herzog and Sipi Livni, Liebman told Israel Radio. We wouldn't be part of such a government. That I can say definitely. He won the election. We would be happy to serve the nation in the opposition. I wasn't born in the foreign ministry, and I don't have to be a minister. Likud sources said Netanyahu does not want Liebman to remain foreign minister because it could force him to also give a top portfolio to Bayat UD leader Naftali Bennett, whose party won more seats than Yisrael Beitenu. First up today is a coalition meeting with United Torah Judaism, followed by talks tomorrow with Bayat UD and Shas. Shas leader Aryeh Derry told reporters at a Mamuna celebration at his Jerusalem home last night that he was prepared to reach an agreement with Likud. We are ready to close a deal as soon as possible, Derry said. It is too bad there isn't a government yet, but I think it will still take time because it depends on other factions that are required to form a coalition. I hope the other factions come to their senses and realize their place. Netanyahu will likely hold personal meetings with the party leaders in an attempt to hurry negotiations along and resolve crises and disagreements, mostly on the issue of portfolios. At a Mamuna celebration last night in Orakiva, Netanyahu urged national unity, though it's unclear if he was referring to the people or the government. But he said the new government would focus on reducing the cost of living. The dust of the election has settled, Netanyahu said. We must strengthen unity among the citizens and people of Israel, and this we will do. He also kept up his assault on the framework nuclear deal between world powers and Iran, warning that the Islamic Republic could not be trusted. To my regret, all of the things I warned about vis-a-vis -vis the framework agreement that was put together in Lusanne are coming true before our eyes, Netanyahu said. This framework gives the leading terrorist state in the world a certain path to nuclear bombs. How can such a country be trusted? And he warned against the immediate lifting of sanctions, according to Iran's demand, and this is without Iran having changed its policy of aggression everywhere. Arye? Thank you, Ellie. U.S. President Barack Obama, meanwhile, pleaded with Congress to refrain from meddling with the framework agreement with Iran and once again chastised Prime Minister Netanyahu for his so-called failure to come up with an alternative plan. Speaking at a press conference in Panama, Obama reminded reporters that a framework is not the same as a final agreement. It's not surprising to me that the Supreme Leader or a whole bunch of other people are going to try to characterize the deal in a way that protects their, polit uh, their political position. But I know what was discussed at, uh, in arriving at the political agreement. What I've always said, though, is, is that there's the possibility of backsliding. There's the possibility that it doesn't get memorialized in a way that satisfies us, that we're able to verify that, in fact, Iran is not getting a nuclear weapon and that we are preserving the capacity to snap back sanctions in the event that they are breaking any deal. Uh, and that's why the work is going to be so important between now and the end of June to memorialize this so that we can all examine it. And we don't have to speculate on what the meaning of a deal is going to be. Either there's going to be a document that Iran agrees with the world community about and a series of actions that have to be taken, or there's not. Uh, part of the challenge in this whole process has been opponents of basically any deal with Iran have constantly tried to characterize what the deal is uh, without seeing it. There's politics and political pressure inside of the United States. We all know that. Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel is deeply opposed to it. I think he's made that very clear. Um, you know, I have repeatedly asked, what is the alternative that you present that you think makes it less likely for Iran to get a nuclear weapon? And I have yet to obtain a good answer on that. Uh, and 
the narrow question that's going to be presented next week when Congress comes back is what's Congress's appropriate role uh, in looking at a final deal. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to not only Bob Corker, but I've talked to Ben Cardin, the ranking uh, member on the Democratic uh, side. And I want to work with them so that Congress can look at this deal when it's done. What I'm concerned about is making sure that we don't prejudge it or those who are opposed to any deal whatsoever try to use a procedural argument essentially to uh, screw up the possibility of a deal. Three residents of the West Bank settlement of Bat Ayan and a Jerusalem resident were arrested today on suspicion of receiving classified military information regarding planned arrest of right-wing activists. The four suspects, all members of a right-wing group, were accused of conspiring to commit a crime, receiving confidential documents, and obstructing the justice. The alleged provider of the documents was an IDF soldier, Elad Sela. Sela, 25, also from Batayim, was arrested by the Shin Bet Security Services last month after he allegedly passed classified information to residents of his hometown. Sela's actions were deemed to pose a serious threat to national security, and military censors placed a gag order on the publications of any further details. Following an historic meeting between U.S. President Barack Obama and Cuban leader Raul Castro, it appears the two nations are on the road to restoring diplomatic ties decades after relations came to a standstill. Obama decided to take a new path after deeming that cutting off the Cuban people from the United States had failed. IBA's Margaret Dutkevich brings us this report. U.S. President Barack Obama met with his Cuban counterpart Raul Castro for an hour in what has been described as the highest level engagement between the two countries in years, ending decades of a standstill. Obama on Saturday described the meeting which took place in a conference room on the sidelines of the Summit of Americas, a historical one, emphasizing that decades of strain has done little to benefit both countries. The history between the United States and Cuba uh, is uh, obviously complicated and over the years a lot of mistrust has developed, uh, but uh, during the course of uh, the last uh, several months, uh, there have been uh, contacts between the U.S. and the Cuban government. Uh, and in December, as a consequence of some of the groundwork that had been laid, uh, both myself and President Castro announced uh, a significant change in uh, policy and the relationship between our two governments. I think that after 50 years of a policy that had not changed on the part of the United States, uh, it was my belief that it was time to try something new. President Obama told reporters he will make a decision on whether to remove Cuba's designation as a state sponsor of terror after reading a review on the matter compiled by the State Department. The Cuban president has insisted on his country's removal from the list as a condition for restoring diplomatic ties. The issue of the state uh, sponsor of terrorism list, uh, as you know, the State Department has provided recommendation. It's gone through our interagency process. I'll be honest with you, I have been on the road. And I want to make sure that I have a chance to read it, study it, uh, before uh, we announce publicly uh, what the policy outcome is going to be. President Castro acknowledged difficult stumbling blocks lay ahead for both countries to repair ties. No one should entertain illusions, he said, adding our countries have a long and complicated history. On Friday, cameras caught the historic handshake as President Obama greeted his Cuban counterpart at the start of the summit. Prior to his arrival in Panama, Obama spoke with Castro by phone, laying the groundwork of what is perceived to become a new era of relations. It has been 18 months since the first direct telephone call between Cuba and America's leaders took place, Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez Perilla told reporters. He expressed hope that the meetings on the sidelines of the summit will pave the way for the renewal of diplomatic ties between the two countries and the lifting of restrictions. Uh, my message here is the Cold War is over. Um, there's still a whole lot of challenges that we face and a lot of uh, issues around the world, and we're still going to have serious issues with Cuba on not just uh, the Cuban government's uh, 
uh, approach to its own people, but also regional issues uh, and concerns. There are going to be areas where we cooperate as well. President Obama also took the opportunity to meet with regional leaders, including Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, which was described as serious and cordial. In recent weeks, the United States described Venezuela as a security threat, accusing them of human rights abuse and imposed sanctions on the country's officials. The 11 ALBA member states, otherwise known as the Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas, threatened to boycott the summit if Cuba was not invited. This year's seventh summit, held over two days in Panama City, allows leaders of the member states to discuss common policy issues as well as regional challenges. With the ice broken and reconciliation the name of the game, the coming weeks are expected to witness efforts by both countries to turn over a new page. Margot Dukevich, IBA News. Pope Francis set off a diplomatic incident today when his Sunday Mass in the Vatican commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide at the hands of Turkey. The Pope spoke of the massacre of as many as 1.5 million Armenians as the first genocide of the 20th century. An angry Turk summoned the Vatican ambassador over the Pope's comments. Turkey acknowledges that many Armenians died in partisan fighting between in the beginning of 1915, but denies that it amounted to genocide. Pope Francis also condemned current day massacres, describing them as genocide created by indifference. He said the international community is currently involved in a third world war, which is being fought piecemeal with daily savage crimes, brutal massacres and senseless destruction. Many Armenians were in the congregation at St. Peter's Basilica to hear the Pope's message. Indians in New Delhi held a protest after a Pakistani court freed on bail Zaki Ur Rahman Lakhvi, the man accused of plotting the 2008 terrorist attack on Mumbai that killed 166 people, including a siege of the city's Chabad house in which six people were murdered. The demonstrators shouted slogans and burned the Pakistani flag, as well as a poster of Lakhvi. The decision to release Lakhvi, age 55, provoked a sharp rebuke from India, which warned that relations between the two nuclear-armed neighbors were deteriorating. Lakhvi heads the LET terrorist group, and according to Indian security officials, he continued to direct the Islamic militants from prison. Lakhvi reportedly received preferential treatment while in prison with access to internet, cell phone, television, and several rooms to receive an unlimited number of visitors. The United States said it was gravely concerned by the court decision, as did Israel's embassy spokesman in India. Zakir Rahman Lavi, the mastermind behind the 2611 attacks, the same attacks in which Israeli nationals and a Jewish center, the Narman House, were also targeted. Uh, this release is a setback in the war against terror in the international efforts against terror in which Israel and India are both close partners. The United Nations will work with the Syrian government to ensure the safety of 18,000 people in the Yarmouk refugee camp near Damascus that Islamic State is battling to take over. This was the word from Ramzi Ezzedin Ramzi, the deputy to the UN envoy to Syria, after meeting Syrian Deputy Foreign Minister Faisal Makdad. His visit to Damascus comes two days after UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon warned that residents of Yarmouk, which has been besieged by the government since 2013, were being held hostage by Islamic State and other extremists. UN officials have warned of a potential massacre there. We left the meeting today uh, quite satisfied and confident that there will be very good cooperation in the future and I hope we will be able to demonstrate that the UN, uh, UNRWA, the UN in general, and the Syrian government can cooperate together uh, on an issue of enormous importance to the international community and uh, a tragedy that has to be avoided at all costs. The situation in the uh, uh, camps is a special case and we need to address it as soon as possible. So we have agreed that we will work together based on what Syria has done over the years and try to intensify this cooperation so that we can address the ongoing tragedy. We want these, uh, the inhabitants in the camp to be confident that their interest is utmost for us and we will do everything possible to ensure their safety and security, whether inside, if possible, but certainly outside and we will work with the Syrian government to ensure that. 
An online video purports to show Islamic State destroying ruins of the ancient Assyrian city of Nimrud in Iraq. The video showed Islamic State members using sledgehammers, jackhammers, a bulldozer, and ultimately explosives to level the site, located near the terrorist-held city of Mosul. In March, both Iraqi and United Nations officials warned the site had been looted and damaged. Islamic State has been destroying ancient relics because they say they pro promote idolatry that violates their fundamental interpretation of Islamic law. Authorities also believe that they've sold other antiquities on the black market to fund their terrorist activities. And in Yemen, Saudi-led airstrikes targeting a military camp killed eight civilians in the city of Taiz today. The attacks were apparently aimed at a site held by soldiers loyal to former Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh who have joined up with Iranian-allied Houthi rebels against local militias. Saudi Arabia and its Sunni allies began airstrikes against the Houthis more than two weeks ago, hoping to prevent their takeover of the southern port of the city of Aden. Salah remains highly influential despite having given up power in 2012 after mass protests against his rule. Germany is preparing for today's commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the Buchenwald concentration camp in 1945. Movie footage reveals the horrific conditions witnessed there by a British parliamentary delegation. Buchenwald was not a Delft camp where Nazis set about their final solution for the systematic extermination of European Jews. Nonetheless, it was equipped with crematoria and gas chambers, and 56,000 inmates perished, including some 11,000 Jews. Many of the other victims were communists, homosexuals and Jehovah Witnesses, prisoners of war, and resistance fighters. Most of the dead had been similarly executed by SS guards, subjected to horrific medical experiments, or forced to work in the armaments factories. Starvation and disease accounted for thousands of deaths. Buchenwald was set up near the eastern city of Weimar. By the time American soldiers arrived to liberate the camp, there were only 21,000 survivors. Scenes of starvation and death almost beyond belief lie open to the sky on every hand. Thousands of bodies have been consumed in the camp incinerators still containing the ashes of the last batch of helpless victims. The members of the delegation hear for themselves of some of the fiendish methods of torture invented and practiced by the SS guards. Too weak to stand up, some of the survivors of Buchenwald have their first taste of comfort for five years. In every corner of the camp lie the branded bodies of men and women dead from the agonies of slow starvation. It's been a tough day for travelers returning home to Israel at the end of the Passover holiday. Three flights from Italy to Israel and a flight from Crete had major delays due to technical reasons, leaving hundreds of stranded abroad. As many as 70,000 people are expected to pass through the airport today, causing crowding in the terminal areas and in the surrounding facilities. Well, taking a look at local finance, and with no foreign currency trading on Sundays, the shekel remains the same, while share prices on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange started off trading with gains. Here's a look at the late afternoon numbers. The traditional Maimuna festivities began at sunset yesterday as Israelis of Moroccan descent marked the end of Passover holiday. The rain and bad weather caused a number of central outdoor celebrations to be canceled. But nevertheless, many, including several prominent politicians, went indoors for a colorful occasion which marked the resumption of eating those forbidden leavened foods. Many families gathered with their friends from other ethnic groups to celebrate with a variety of customary delicacies, including the freshly baked mufaleta. The tables are decorated with a host of dairy products, fruits, vegetables, and other foods that symbolize unity and abundance. It was a severe post-Passover storm with rain and hail falling in many parts of the country today. There was snow on Mount Hermon and even in some peaks in the Galilee, which is unusual for this time of the year. And while many Maimuna celebrations were rained out, the stormy weather brought out some die-hard surfers who took pleasure in the high waves and surfed off the coast. The forecast for tomorrow calls for more rain in the north and central parts of the country until tapering off on Tuesday. Here's a look at the expected highs and lows at home and abroad for the next 24 hours.
Well, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Aaron Viner will be at this desk tomorrow to bring you the latest breaking news from Israel. Please join her. Until then, I'm Arya O'Sullivan wishing you a wonderful evening and shalom from Jerusalem.